My name is Corey Firth and I'm the Executive Director of the Canadian Psychedelic Association and I'm super excited to be dropping in with you all tonight here from Kingston, Ontario, situated on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabek Nation. I want to start by acknowledging the first peoples who lived and contributed to uh, this land and whose practices and spiritualities are deeply tied to the territory and the existing relationship to those that call it home. I'm joined here tonight by two of my amazing colleagues, two trailblazers in the psychedelic space and two genuinely kind, thoughtful and empowering people doing so much amazing work to move the psychedelic space forward and contributing to a new paradigm of holistic health and well-being. Pam and Paul, welcome. I'm so excited to be here tonight with you all. Um, I think I could go on and on and on um, about intros uh, for both of you, but I thought for maybe the one or two folks that aren't super familiar with you uh, attending that we could just do a quick intro. So maybe Pam, we'll start with you and then you can pass it over to Paul. Just say hi and maybe just give us a little update on some of the stuff you're working on maybe. Thanks, Corey. Hi, everyone. I'm Pam Crisco. I am one of the founding board members of the Canadian Psychedelic Association. Um, I'm also a researcher working with a number of uh, projects, uh, including the microdose.me study, uh, as well as some other studies related to ketamine. Um, I am a, a professor at BIU and a clinical instructor at UBC, and um, I uh, mostly love being in the garden full time whenever I can. I'll hand that over to Paul. Hi, everybody. My name is Paul Stamets. Um, I want to acknowledge the ancestral lands of the Kalus people, unceded territory here in British Columbia. I'm speaking to you from a remote island um, in BC. We just got our power back. Woohoo! So we had a blended technology of wood stoves, gas generators, and a Tesla battery wall that went empty. Um, but anyhow, I'm honored to be here and I've been studying mushrooms, it seems like. When I was in the womb, um, this is my, I say that because R. Gordon Wasson um, was given uh, by Maria Savina, a Mazatec shaman, uh, psilocybe cellular lessons. Uh, when that was in May of 1955, I was born in July of 55. So I feel like, you know, I was connected all the way back then. But I academically got involved in mushrooms and psilocybin mushrooms when I was about 16 years of age. And so, Honored to be here and happy to have this conversation. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for joining us. I'm super excited about this talk uh, for many reasons, for many reasons that I think a lot of others are, are here. But for me, close to home, one of the main reasons is because I know a lot of my friends and family actually purchased tickets to, 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 to be here tonight and to join us. And that just shows me, you know, how much the culture has really shifted and where the stigma around drugs and psychedelics is starting to disappear a little bit and more and more people are open to the idea of how plants and fungi can really help play a large part in the way we heal ourselves and heal the planet like that little poster you have behind you there Paul. Um, so you know before I get into questions um, as this is a QA, and I just want to say thank you both um, for all that you do and I told you sort of in the pre-call that I'd make you blush, but really, I just I have to say thank you so much um, for the incredible contribution you both have have provided to the, the psychedelic space specifically and and the medical field in general. But um, yeah, you guys have worked for many many years uh, isolated and behind the scenes um, before you know People Magazine and Forbes and the CBC were even talking about all this. So. Well, I know both of you don't do this work for the accolades. Um, it is important to honor those that have been around and doing this work in the shadows. Uh, we're transitioning right now, it seems like from that psychedelic renaissance into what we might call a revolution where real action is starting to take place. And, and you both are a, a huge reason for that. So on behalf of myself, my family um, and the community here, I just wanted to say thank you so much for everything that you guys have done so far and continue to put into the world. Thanks, Corey. Before we dive in, um, I just wanted to take a moment and honor the exciting year that we've had with the CPA and, and celebrate a, a massive year of growth within the psychedelic space. Um, it's been a pretty crazy year. I'm sure a lot of you uh, listening in have kind of caught on to this from some of the publicity and PR and, and, uh, and chatter around psychedelics and, and specifically mushrooms probably since uh, Paul's documentary landed on Netflix. I know I've gotten a lot of messages about uh, mushroom forging and things like that. 
Um, from the CPA side of things, we've we've had a really great year. We've uh, expanded our membership from some amazing, uh, curious, and excited members that I see funneling into the chat here and dropping in some wisdom. Uh, we've expanded our advocacy efforts with many really exciting new initiatives, and we've partnered with, partnered with some really great organizations who are looking to really revolutionize mental health care in, in Canada. And one of the biggest initiatives that we have going right now is our Canada Supports Alliance campaign, where we've brought together the top researchers, MDs, lawyers, and business leaders in the space to bring new psilocybin regulations to Health Canada. And our goal is to bring that new framework forward for psilocybin therapy by July 1st, 2022, but we really do need your help. Um, so James or Deanna, I think will be dropping a link into the chat to visit canadasupports.ca to learn more about how we're progressing there. And we're really trying to raise $15,000 by the end of the year in order to keep this momentum moving into 2022. So please drop over there and, uh, and take a look at what we're up to there. And, and if you feel uh, so inclined to pledge your support, that'd be greatly appreciated. I also wanted to mention too at this time, as I know not everyone joining us tonight is a member, um, but we do uh, have a membership giveaway going on right now where all new members as of December 20th will be entered into a draw to win over $4,000 in uh, prizes, including a plant scholarship to Hollows Global Retreats down in Costa Rica, a uh, copy of Paul's book, Psilocybin Mushrooms of the World, which he may talk about. I know he's got it with him. And uh, a couple of free tickets to the Catalyst Psychedelic Conference, which will be happening here in Kingston, Ontario in, uh, in the spring of 2022. And, and obviously many other amazing prizes there. So to learn more about that, uh, James, I believe, has put that in the chat. Visit joincpa.ca. And uh, before we get into the questions, I believe Paul had a few words for some of our special volunteers. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much, Corey, and Dr. Pam. So I have a special thanks uh, to Vincent in web development, James in events, Matthew, Kristen, Sheldon, Robin, Jaya, and Hannah in social media, Cass, Emily, Joe, volunteer coordination, uh, Bia in tech support, Michael, customer service, Elizabeth and Stephanie and uh, fundraising, Liam and Braden, video edits, and Diana, head of administration, herder of cats and wearer of many hats. I thought I'd just throw that in there. So, um, and I, I have, you know, this is, we're giving away like four or five, I'm, I have seven five. books out, but we're giving away autograph copies of Psilocybin Mushrooms of the World and Mycelium Running, which is really a fantastic book for people who want to do something with mushrooms to help to save the planet. Growing Gourmet, uh, Medicinal Mushrooms and the Mushroom Cultivator. It's a thousand pages basically on how to cultivate mushrooms. Um, so I will start off. I have never been an apologist for my interest in psilocybin mushrooms. It's been a really long journey uh, to get here. I am carrying a torch as many others have carried the torch through the ages. This is a sacred duty and responsibility that many of us feel is, is so important and dear to our heart. And I just wanna put this in the, in the context that mushrooms are very much unifying a force across continents, across cultures. There's more than 116 psilocybin active mushroom species um, in a genus that has about 220. The genus is psilocybe. Um, so it, it's, um, that's the Latin genus. Inside the genus are species. Within species are varieties or phenotypes. And we can talk about that as well. But these are growing circumpolar from Southern Chile into the Arctic, you know, from the Pacific Northwest all the way into Asia and Europe. And the indigenous use of these mushrooms as one would expect uh, indigenous peoples being very tight and dependent upon the ecosystem, um, ecosystem awareness, um, trial and error. And people ask me, well, how do you know which mushrooms are edible? I go, well, it's from the experience that the people have eaten them before us. <laughs> uh, that's actually a very accurate statement. How do we know what frogs are edible? Some frogs are poisonous. What plants, right? It's through experimentation. So indigenous people all over the world would experiment um, and through you know, it's kind of hard to fathom how some indigenous people discovered some of these species because as a mycologist, some of them are quite difficult to identify. And for foraging for psilocybin mushrooms in the wild can be, can be a challenge and can be dangerous. So that's why the availability of, of cultivated mushrooms is, is great. But it's, it's a bridge 
of experience. And I think the message that many of us receive from psilocybin mushrooms is the unanimity of being, the importance of being connected with nature, respecting our ancestors, and respecting the indigenous knowledge of people that have put down their lives in many cases in order to have this knowledge survive. It's amazing that we have this knowledge that survived. All the persecutions, the religious wars, the, politiz the politicization, which I think Pam and I will be talking about as well. So it's really, I'm, I'm greatly honored that this movement has kind of come up to a, a higher level. The foundation of this movement goes back, you know, thousands and thousands of years. And so many people have been persecuted for their belief. In, and it's so weird, they're persecuted for something that, creates goodness you know the threat of goodness you know is disturbing to the authoritarian regimes yeah so i think this is a really a people's movement it's a revolution from the underground that's sweeping the world right now i'm so honored to be a part of it so with that i'll turn it over to dr pam yeah thanks paul pam do you have anything to add there i, I did have just a quick uh thought is I don't think I mentioned before, you know, we're not going to just talk about psilocybin and, and psychedelics here. There's a lot more that we're going to cover, especially within the questions, but Pam, over to you with anything to add. I can't follow that. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. Everyone grab your notebooks. Cause I feel like there's a lot to, to take in here. So uh, this is recorded and it will be live. If you're a member, you'll be able to get access to that live recording when we're done. Um, but yeah, feel free to grab a notepad because there's a lot to, to take in. Why don't we jump into some of the questions? Uh, so we polled our members before this event and had a pile of questions come through. So depending on time, we're going to try to get through all of those, but we will open up time for live Q&A as well. So feel free. I see some, some questions already coming into the Q&A. Uh, feel free to drop a question in there. Don't use the chat. Use the Q&A or Deanna will yell at me. Um, so uh, why don't we jump in? Uh, a uh, member of ours, uh, Daniel Dag or Daggle, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, asks, what are your thoughts on the recent re-emergence of interest for psychedelics and the probable rise of popularity for psychedelic assisted therapy that we will see in the coming years in, term of the in terms of the respect and preservation of indigenous practices around the use of these medicines? Can we have a widespread use of these medicines without the framework provided by various indigenous shamanic traditions around the world? Um, Pam, why don't we start with you on that one? Well, I'll, yeah, I'll start a little bit. I mean, some some of these medicines have been with us for a long time. And I think, you know, the return to community and the return to group work and group journeys and, and you know, really connecting back with our roots is fantastic and honoring and, and returning back to our Indigenous roots completely and honoring those places where we are uh, uninvited guests upon is really interesting with those medicines but there's also new medicines that have come since the 50s and 60s and 70s and those are also in the psychedelic family so i think we're at a very interesting time that we can navigate nicely to go how can we honor indigenous past traditions use of these medicines psilocybin as paul's already mentioned is is quite unique because it's it's available everywhere so it's kind of indigenous to all of us so that's kind of a fun idea for that I think of like I think of my family who who um, migrated to North America from northern 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 Europe and their use of, of what they would have used and how interesting that is but I think it's really a, a fantastic opportunity for us to reach hands across you know these medicines as the new ones that have been have found their way from the bench uh, from the lab bench and the ones that have been around probably longer than many um, of the human species that we are us as humans. So um, I think there's a, a really, I think we're at a, a nice time that we can really tie these together, honor the past tradition, and maybe even create new and better ones um, because everything evolves, even, even our traditions, they evolve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said. Paul, anything to add to that? Well, I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, you know, it's often said that history is written by the conquerors. And so how much knowledge have we lost? I mean, um, Gu Zhao is a good friend of ours. He's a, one of the chiefs of the Haida Gwaii. Um, and he, he, you know, we spent a lot of time together and, and he said it quite bluntly. I was pretty amazed by his honesty. He said, 
my grandfather, grandmother and her mother knew a lot about the use of sacred plants and medicinal, and medicinal mushrooms and even psilocybin mushrooms likely. But I said, Paul, think about this. We had two flu pandemics and this, and this is, at the term of art is immunologically naive. Um, when you grow up in, in, in you grow up in Europe, you have flu uh, viruses and other pox viruses circulating. There's a little bit of a herd and innate immunity that builds up from exposure, you know, genetically over time. But with the Pacific Coast North indigenous peoples, as an example, uh, in the Haida and the Haida Gwaii, um, immunologically naive, which means they've had no ex exposure to these viruses. Two flu pandemics, two pox pandemics, fatalities between 80 to 90 percent of the people, 10 to 20 years apart. Wow. Think about how much knowledge was lost because so much of these traditions were oral mm -hmm. and where they have been written or where we have artists that have recorded them. And that's what I think is really interesting is that they, the artifacts that have survived over time and the cave uh, drawings in northern Algeria uh, of the bee man that clearly shows the interest in psilocybin mushrooms and psilocybin mushrooms being put in honey, uh, not only in northern Africa and Europe, but also in, in Mesoamerica, even to this day in Latin America and, and in Mexico, et cetera, is a common way of preserving psilocybin mushrooms because they rot so quickly. And by putting them in honey, you can preserve them because of the high sugar and the antibacterial properties. And then the mushrooms would begin to start to ferment. And so you get fermented psilocybin mushrooms and honey, which leads to mead. And so the Bavarian Beer Act of 1516 specifically banned mushrooms from being put into beer. Um, this was, a, a, I think, a tactic by the Catholic Church in order to suppress pagan religions in Europe. And so, and then we go forward and we see the Eleusinian Mysteries which persisted for 1,500, maybe 2,000 years. The Eleusinian Mysteries, were, which was a, a sacred journey once per lifetime in Greek culture, um, that you were heckled uh, by people dressed up in costumes as animals and other nature figures as you marched to this great telestrion that held several hundred people. Uh, and you had this group experience, punishable by imprisonment, uh, and heavy fines, if it ever be mentioned, Aristotle, Plato, uh, Plato, Sophocles, all partook of the Eleusinian mysteries, which which great, greatly informed them. Um, sorry, greatly informed them. Um, you know, in terms of of, of philosophy, etc. So, simultaneous to the Eleusinian mysteries, there was also in uh, the use we think of mushrooms in Mesoamerica, as evidenced by mushroom stones. Uh, these are the mushroom stones that were little statues, and they could have had a plurality and more likely of, of symbolism, invoking rain, fertility, mushrooms, you know, being you know, signifying you know, the importance of psilocybin mushrooms. And it, so it was interesting that in, in Greek culture, at the same time, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is strange. I'm, I'm doing a seminar right now. I can't answer the phone. Sorry. Unless it's someone cool, you can you can bring them in. <laughs> um, so anyhow, um, so what I'm what I'm basically so indigenous cultures in both regions of the world then were subjected to authoritarian aggression in trying to suppress the use of these substances that were liberating, spiritually liberating, that you know were. By definition, you know, you know, Christianity um, and authoritarian religions all over the world suppress the religions that are contrary to their precepts. Uh, this is the, the dominance of religion, which is obviously involves capitalism, tithing, supporting the church, you know, collecting taxes, etc. So th this struggle, I think, is is the narrative that unfortunately pervades throughout history with all indigenous peoples all over the world. Uh, and the most dramatic and drastic examples, of course, have been what has happened in, in the North Americas and the Mesoamerican regions of recent history. So 
it's a shared tra tragedy and a shared responsibility that we all need to recognize the importance of indigenous people. But the message that's come from these experiences is universally appropriate for everyone. Yeah, and the compounding effect of all that work that you talked about and all that history is really coming to a, a head, it seems like, and we've been fortunate enough, I think, where we're at today, where it seems like there's a light at the end of the tunnel, which we'll get to a little bit around the, the psilocybin regulations that we, uh, we aim to achieve here coming soon in 2022 and our efforts and some of the efforts of the rest of the community, of course. Uh, but I do want to jump into another question here from Karen, Karen Lindsay. Um, after a few successful experiences with psilocybin, I can no longer tolerate it. I feel like I've swallowed battery acid. Judging by online forums, I'm not alone in this and wonder if you have any advice. It might be useful to know that LSD, even at micro doses, does the same. I've never heard of that. Um, Pam, maybe any thoughts there from you? First? I think Paul, no, Paul, you should talk on this. He, he's, he's, he's a mycologist. He knows this well. Got it. Well, it's interesting, both LSD and psilocybin are, are fungally related, you know, LSD coming from Clavisips uh, purpura. Um, so there is that fungal connection, but there's a mismatch oftentimes in the microbiome. Some, uh, some people who do not like or can't digest mushrooms in general, it's a really important thing that all therapists should ask. The, and the front end question is, do you like mushrooms? Do mushrooms sit with you well, you know, in your stomach? Because uh, about a one percent, two percent of the population cannot produce the enzymes that can break down the the fungal cell walls, and so there's a mismatch of their microbiome. And so, if you can't stomach mushrooms well, and some people can't, Alexander Smith, one of the greatest mycologists in the world, could not stomach mushrooms. Um, so that's really actually a scientific, uh, you know, feedback that's important. Um, I know many people who get the gag response. Uh, Psilocybe cubensis does not taste good in you know, many people's palates. And but this is why the, and the, and the and many psilocybin mushrooms are very bitter in that sense. And that's why the Aztecs uh, realized by combining it with chocolate, which is a tradition still being practiced. And so psilocybin mushrooms in chocolate makes them a lot more palatable. You don't get the gag response. And I think it also helps set, sets up the microbiome for better digestibility. Now, when it comes to the LSD, I don't know really how to characterize that um, because that's really, really different because uh, LSD is, is primarily synthesized. It's not a naturally derived. The majority of people are taking psilocybin mushrooms, not psilocybin the molecule. The majority of people are taking LSD, not erga derived or morning glory uh, seeds, et cetera. So I, I don't know, under, understand how to answer that response, um, unless it's an associated response that's carried over from the experience of psilocybin. But, you know, chocolate makes a big difference in the palatability of mushrooms. Um, and um, she's not the only one <laughs> who's had that experience of like, these really taste terrible. And uh, so when you're starting a major journey, it'd be nice to have something that's a lot more palatable and like, oh, wow, these taste great. I'm, I'm in for a great journey. <laughs> You start off your journey like practically throwing up. You're like, oh my goodness, what am I in for? So, yeah, I was just uh, went with the luckily, <laughs> luckily sort of it tastes awful and it works slogan, and I just assumed it was that. Um, that's good to know. Um, Karen had another question too. I think this one's this one's for Pam. Um, there's two coming up actually. How how are we going to prevent big pharma from taking over the psychedelic space? <laughs> Yeah. Whoa. Okay. We, that's one question for another one, probably fully, but let's, let's, let's try to limit it. Maybe do a quick synopsis of what that answer might be. Big question. I, well, I think the reality is, is you're not going to stop pharma. You're not going to stop um, companies that think there's one, something that works or two, something where they can make money off of um, that's going to happen. Um, I think there's a, a continuity here that we can speak of, like a, a, full, a full circle, if you think about it. There will be a portion of the population that wants a pill. That's, that's all there is to it. They will want the pill and they will want the pharmaceutical product. And for that case, pharma will be involved in it. And, you know, maybe pharma will get some answers with clinical trials, you know, what, what medicine for what condition, at what dose, at what frequency, these are a lot of unknowables. And right now what's happening is we're having a lot of N of one studies. My, me studying myself, what works for me, Corey 
the same, everybody else the same. And so pharmaceutical uh, clinical trials and, and clinical trials to the pharmaceutical standard will certainly be very beneficial. And, you know, there will, like I said earlier, there will be people that do want it in a pill that will say, I'm taking, you know, psilocybin for my Parkinson's and I want it at this dose and I want to control that. And then on the other hand, so th that's going to happen. I, I, I think what we, the real question is, is how can we keep them accountable? How can we keep them ethical? How can we keep them in integrity? How can we demand um, that they give back, that there's reciprocity, that there's give back to the commons, that it's not all about just profit, that they are, they see themselves as citizens of this society with obligations to this society to give back, whether in training or scholarships or just frankly, just giving away. I think there'll be something in between that too. There'll be nutraceutical lines, things that, you know, pair things at, at different levels, and, you know, in the microdosing level, definitely we'll see that as more probably closer to a nutraceutical or a prescribable vitamin. And then of course, there'll always be the underground. But I mean, and the, hopefully the underground will just become above ground because what will happen is we'll have the, the intelligence will filter into the policymakers and they'll recognize that these are substances that are much needed for us and that there will be an ability for a wonderful way of, of us getting these products safely um, as we do right now. Like, like Paula said this many times before, 99% of all of this is happening in the underground right now. There's no reason for that not to continue, but let's bring it above ground and make it safer, make it maybe nicer. <laughs> maybe you can go to, an, you know, as cannabis transitioned, right? Now you can go to beautiful vape lounges and beautiful cannabis places, dispensaries that have beautiful products set out. It, it, there's a, certainly an opportunity there. So I don't, I don't think that the entry of big pharma into this is necessarily going to take away from the other parts. And it may bring the standards up too. It may bring it the safety and manufacturing up to the levels that you want as a consumer. You want to know that the person who is you're getting your mushrooms from doesn't have a moldy batch there that is going to give you upset stomach. So I, I, I don't think, I, again, I don't think you can prevent anything that makes money, but we can certainly as citizens demand that they do it in a very good way that does give back and does recognize um, all the pioneers like Paul and others that have been in this for a very, very long time and have done all the really heavy lifting. Yeah, yeah, I think there's a lot to learn from cannabis, like you mentioned too, um, in terms of that safety and, and those protocols to, to make sure that everything is, is coming off, um, you know, clean and at the highest quality. Um, you alluded to a little bit of this, Pam, but Jessica asked a specific question um, around some of that ethics and uh, safety piece. What are some of the most impactful ways that we can assist with advancing the psychedelic movement? And uh, she's passionate about increasing safety, uh, ethical and equitable access to psychedelic medicine and would love to know how to focus her time and energy most efficiently. So I think you said kind of broadly there, but maybe more on the individual level. Paul, you wanna jump in? I have some ideas. You go first. Well, I, I think it's, psilocybin fundamentally can benefit our society on in reducing crime and helping people resolve, you know, trauma uh, to help people with the anxiety of end of life. Um, I think psilocybin should be available for everybody, um, irrespective of of their income, uh, they should be made affordable or given free. The, the, the benefit, the return on investment. And I, I like speaking to this because I have a family member, you know, who's been in prison. Um, and um, he also committed a violent crime defending a woman. Um, but when the police showed up, you know, he had the baseball bat. Um, so that he, that he got arrested and got thrown in prison. So it affected me, it affected my brothers and his sister, my, my parents. Um, and so the reverberations from a person who is a perpetrator of violence affects your immediate family, your community, your neighbors, your city, your village, your state, your country, the world. Um, and then you, the victim, of course, is the focus of all of this harm 
and it's their family, their friends, their neighbors, their village, their city, their state, their country, their world. But what psilocybin does is the opposite of that, is that like a pebble in the pond of goodness, when people have a psilocybin experience and they can resolve these issues and overcome their trauma, what's the new narrative? The new narrative is saying, oh my gosh, this person was heavily traumatized or this person fundamentally changed. That's why I told Michael Pollan, psilocybin changed my mind. Um, and it changed my mind for the better because I feel like I'm a kinder, better, more empathetic person, less quick to judgment. And I'm learning every day. So I'm a student you know, of trying to be a better person. But I think that this is the return on the investment for society is that if we can reduce crime, and Zach Walsh, one of our co-authors, we just published a paper recently, um, and he was a co-author in several uh, studies, meta-studies, showing that a single experience with psilocybin, a statistically significant reduction in partner-to-partner -partner violence, um, in larceny, burglary, and theft. Um, I think this is amazing uh, that there is a cost-benefit ratio in providing psilocybin uh, to, to all the people in need, and there should not be an economic uh, barrier uh, or hurdle that they have to overcome because the implications and the return on investment for society and reducing crime and helping law enforcement focus on things they really need to focus on. If we can prevent crime and we have harm reduction, the benefits of society is enormous, just absolutely enormous. So I, I just, I, I will say that, you know, the, the problem with the psilocybin mushroom underground is what Pam just alluded to is uh, moldy samples, samples with bacteria in them. Um, the, there are people don't have the good controls that have been set up for the food industry. So the role of government is to protect the health and of the people. And I think that governmental uh, controls are essential uh, for the commercialization of psilocybin uh, as it's being distributed to citizens. Um, I think individually, of course, anyone should be able to grow their own or collect their own in the wild. Um, there should be no restrictions on that. But as soon as you're involved in a handing it to somebody else for commercial or therapeutic use, it's no longer about your individual rights. You are now being entrusted with a sacred duty and you have to be responsible for the health and the protection of the individuals that you are giving the sacred medicine to. And so that is where I think we all have a collective responsibility and that's where the government needs to come in, you know, with sensible, you know, equitable uh, regulations that us as a community can help inform those government officials what those legal guardrails should be. Mm. Very well said. I'd like to answer a little bit more of, of Jessica's question as well. What can we do? I, there has been an enormous impact of the war on drugs on why we're even here where we're at. We've had a 40 year hiatus of where, what that we shouldn't have had. And so that propaganda that we were all fed, I was well fed it too. This is your brain on drugs with the frying pan, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that, that still lingers. And when you realize it was completely propaganda and it wasn't based on science or fact, then it changes everything. The CPA actually, we did a webinar on it uh, quite a while ago with uh, Dr. Um, Neil Boyd and Dr. Deborah Small. And they covered it wonderfully, uh, the war on drugs on both, both sides of the border. And, and I really hope that people will watch that. And the reason I go into that is that once we recognize that we've had a four decade error that should have never happened, then, then we can really move forward because that's really what's in our way is these misconceptions around these medicines as, and the, the propaganda that they're dangerous or you'll, you'll, do, you'll hurt yourself. You know, We drive in cars every day. We hurt ourselves every day and yet cars are legal. There's ways, like Paul said, to do this very safely. And so what you can all do, everyone watching, is advocate. You know, our politicians, our policymakers, they just need to know that you will support them. They need to know that this is politically safe for them to proceed. So even a simple email or a simple letter or a simple phone call to your MP or your MLA, or if you're watching from some other country, whatever your uh, political representative is, 
call them, let them know this is okay. This is medicine. We want to see this move forward because when there's no way for them to argue in, in, at your government level, when everybody's on the same um, board or everyone's moving forward at the same place and people see that they're, that healthcare response people are getting healthier, they're losing their PTSD, firefighters are losing their PTSD. The, the, like Paul said, the return on investment is insane. Like one psilocybin treatment in a PTSD person probably saves the system $50,000 or more. So even if you don't like helping people, if you like saving money, these medicines save money. But I mean, it's more important that these medicines help people. So you just need, we, we all need to let our politicians know it's safe for them to proceed and that we want this. And this is the will of the citizens that they represent. Very well said. Um, I'll drop in here with a quick promotion for what we're up to at the CPA as well. We, uh, we presented a memorandum of regulatory analysis to Health Canada in September uh, that would allow for access to psilocybin mushrooms for those experiencing end of life distress and anxiety. Um, for anyone who missed it at the beginning, please, uh, and James or Deanna, if you can just drop the link in there again to visit canadasupports.ca to learn about what we're doing there. And we're doing some fundraising now till the end of the year, hoping to raise about $15,000. So if anything of what you've heard from Pam and Paul so far inspires you, uh, please feel free. That's one way that, um, you know, your dollar can go a long way to making these things legal. Um, but on that note, Pam, uh, you talked about it. Uh, a little bit there, uh, and I think uh, Paul, you did as well. Your team recently had a historical event uh, with the first group uh, psilocybin therapy session. Can you talk a little bit about that? I know it just came out a couple weeks ago. Yeah, thanks, Corey. Um, so uh, my my uh, ther our therapy team, it's a big therapy team, a multi multidisciplinary therapy team on Vancouver Island called Roots to Thrive. A group of that team created My Community Thrives. And we were able to conduct the first legal psilocybin mushroom group journey in North America ever uh, with nine patients who had their Section 56 exemption from the federal health minister. We got the last exemption 30 minutes before <laughs> the day started. Uh, so we were grateful for that. And it was, it was one of the most profound, it brings tears to my eyes, it's one of the most profound episode, sorry, you know, to watch people that have end of life distress and anxiety to be able to, sorry. <laughs> it's, all good. it's just amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. And, and why should you have to wait till end of life? Why? You shouldn't have to. Yeah. Yeah, the right to, right to die, the right to try, right? Yeah. yeah I mean, how, how dare the, the government, you know, uh, try to tell you at the end of your life, how you're going to die? I mean, um, you know, I, I think that you're you you have a right to your own consciousness. Um, I think the government should stop, you know, um, at that point. But it's just the absurdity to these these people who are so d desperate for understanding their their at the end of their life. What does this all mean? I mean, this is we're all going to die, folks. <laughs> New news. <laughs> Uh, note to self, I mean, we're all going to face this. And I have witnessed people who have died with courage and optimism and beautiful deaths. Um, and I've witnessed people who have not. And, um, you know, I my father wanted me to give him psilocybin mushrooms, and I turned him down. Alexander Smith, the father, one of the fathers of American mycology, you know, who wrote a monograph on the genus Psilocybe, who published numerous species. Um, he asked me if I would trip with him. And with both my father and Alexander Smith, I had the same sort of response. Will your wife trip with you and with us? And uh, my father's wife, Mona, would not. Uh, Alexander Smith's wife, Helen, would say no, uh, or did say no. And so I thought, you know, if I have this experience with you and it fundamentally changes your mind, I don't want to be responsible for the chasm between you and your partner. Mm. How, you know, it's not by, I mean, and this is why I adopted the policy long ago. Nature provides, I don't. I, I clearly saw that the potency of these psilocybin mushrooms and they're largely beneficial for the majority of the people, but some people go into crisis. I'm not a skilled therapist. 
I don't want the karma of someone having a bad trip. I don't know. I don't really know how to handle that. That's not my skill set. It's Pam's skill sets. It's, it's the Canadian Psychedelic Association skill sets. This is why these skills are so important and therapists are so badly needed in order to shepherd this. And because it is a difficult experience for some people who then often say it's the most significant experience of their lives, which they don't want to repeat. You know, that's interesting. How can something be so significantly beneficial that you don't want to repeat it? This is why psilocybin is anti-addictive by definition. Um, and this is why the pharmaceutical industry, as interested as they are in this, in this, these new psychedelics, I think they're also very concerned about this business model because they want a business model where you would repeatedly buy their material. Um, so if you do a drug and it, it fixes your life and you're, that's the only time you have to buy it, well, that's not a very good business model. So and anyhow, I, all these things come into play, but I, I think that what the CPA is doing and the therapeutic guidance of psilocybin, what I really like, and Dr. Pam, I've said this to you before, I, I have not done ayahuasca um, yet. Um, my opportunities for doing ayahuasca in Peru were in group set settings with strangers. I had heard too many times of somebody would have a meltdown. And you're in with 10, 20, 30 strangers. One person has a meltdown. You now share their grief. Um, that's a lot to, 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 to absorb. So, but in the right... Uh, the Roots to Thrive scenario, you have eight or nine people facing the same issue, end of life trauma. And so you have a natural community of people of sharing. And so it's a real different modality. And so I, I think this, this group therapy at end of life with the people who are sharing the same issues is a beneficial bridge between those individuals as opposed to the... the um, pay-per-view ayahuasca commercialization that has proliferated throughout, you know, Peru and elsewhere. So I know I'm going to get in trouble for this, folks. <laughs> Some people are going to be upset at me for saying this, but this is this is my from my own personal perspective. I think that, you know, if if you give these psilocybin mushrooms to somebody else, you better damn be well know what you're doing, because it's not right for you to give such a powerful substance to somebody without being able to be there for them through the entire journey. Mm -hmm. That's a great segue into one of our member questions from Maria, who's a pharmacist, but she has a specific question around the healthcare professionals. And as we see these things become legalized, what you're saying in a lot of ways is about safety um, and understanding. And I think of having your own experiences as well. That's one of the big things that I hear about and see a lot is making sure you've had your own experiences. but. Maria asks uh, how Paul and Pam have incorporated psychedelic therapies into their clinical and research practices. And bear with me, it's a bit of a long question, but because you've touched on a few pieces. Uh, what advice are they willing to offer other healthcare professionals that are passionate about access to safe supply, public service, and respect of spiritual and indigenous, indigenous traditions who wish to explore entering this space and making a positive impact in advancing the movement? Any successes, struggles, and learnings that you're willing to share so far that you haven't already? Yeah, there's a lot to unpack in that question. <laughs> yeah, you know, I can pick it apart for you too. Yeah, like, well, just general I mean, sort of like from a professional standpoint as they're entering the field. As and Pam, maybe you can even talk about your program that's coming out too. Yeah, yeah. There's a I. You know, I I gave a um, presentation last night to some docs and uh, on opportunities for training. Um, and I gave a similar presentation just over two years ago. And just over two years ago, there was about five programs. And now it, there's been absolutely an explosion. Uh, Vancouver Island University is launching a program next year, postgraduate certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies. University of Ottawa is launching next year, master's in psychedelic therapies and, and spiritual care. There is, um, you know, Naropa University in the US. There's the University of Wisconsin. 
that are launching programs. So there's a lot more academic programs. So those people that are at, you know, at the beginning stages of their academic training, you know, maybe they're in high school or graduating, they're gonna have these a lot more opportunities right out of the gate. I suspect that every university that has a psychology or counseling program will be integrating psychedelic therapies. And if not, they'll be left in the dust. I think every medical school, their psych psychiatric programs will start covering psychedelic medicine. Otherwise they will also be left in the dust. Um, and so it's happening and there's just been an absolute explosion of programs online as well. Um, but I, I would, you know, if people are looking at professional development, I would look at ones that are academically credentialed because then you'll have the credentials. And I think that's where it's going to go anyway. So those people that are working in the underground, you have great, great large skill sets, start transitioning, anticipating that those skill sets are going to be needed and will be covered. So keep keep the training going and have an eye on the ball going out into the future that this will likely be above ground. So for professionals, also research, if you're interested in research, the, the opportunities for research are endless. We have so many clinical questions to answer about which medicine for what use at what, how often, um, even which medicine for creativity or uh, which, which medicine is better to, if you're a musician or if you, you know, want to be a better athlete, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's, a, there's, it doesn't, it's not just for unwellness. It's also for our wellness and our, you know, expansion of our consciousness and, and who we are fundamentally as human beings. And why are we even here, you know, if not for our community, for what we do in community and then the science. So, I mean, we've, you know, Paul, you want to talk about the microdose study because we've just, that's just been yeah. published in Nature Scientific Reports. And so it, it's a, a great example of citizen science meeting researchers and, and finding another way to get science out there. Yeah, it was, um, Pam and I had a lot of discussions and um, we were talking at one point, you know, the problem with clinical studies is they're such small groups of people. And yet when you have large groups of people, it's so expensive. But how do you, how do you discover in Pam's words, signal from the noise, um, because if the data is too small, you might just have one a one offer, or one person has an experience in a group of fifty or hundred, and what do you make of that? So, um, and Pam introduced me to Ismian Kalin, uh, who have quantified citizen. They were developing an app, which eventually became Microdose.me. Uh, so, I encourage everybody here, please check out Microdose.me. We have over 14,000 people that have joined this observational survey. You're self-reporting. It's, it's anonymized. You own your own data. It's gone through ethics. Um, and it's basically a, a comparison of people who microdose or don't microdose. And our first paper that we just published is over 8,000 people. Surprisingly, and this is something that we're just blown away by, over 4,000 people are non-microdosers um, that reported. And these are challenge tests. There's is a memory test. It's a hearing, vision, um, cognition challenges. All of these that are used in, in psychiatry. And we published this. It came out um, on November 18th. Um, it soared and it's in the top 1% of all articles ever published in the nature publication ecosystem. That's nature medicine, nature physics, you know, this is the same scientific reports as one of the nature journals. Um, so that's, a, I think that shows that that's the impact uh, for us scientists is that that's a big deal, right? It's a, right, we're having a big impact because the article is, uh, covers this. And we found really, it was a, a horizontal study, observational, you know, your, your age, your sex, your income, uh, other habits that might influence you. Well, what's your motivations for taking, taking a, a, a microdose? And so a microdose is defined as subsensorium, basically a dose of psilocybin or LSD, psilocybin mushrooms, by the way. Um, I don't think we had anybody taking pure psilocybin. It's all psilocybin mushrooms. Uh, and the motivations, of course, is you know, presence, you know, um, you know in, in, in increasing creativity, uh, you know, fighting depression, et cetera. So our paper was published, and um, then we submitted another paper and it was interesting, in October 28th, we got our notice of notification of acceptance. October 29th, the next day, we submitted our second paper. And this paper is going to be very exciting to a lot of people because this implies cause and effect. Um, and this is something that we actually found some verticals um, that are hard to explain away by respondency, respondents bias, you can call it expectancy bias, 
Um, we have a lot of problems calling it a placebo because this is not a controlled study. Um, but what's happened in these microdosing studies is that we're seeing an amplification that is well beyond the quote unquote placebo um, effect. And so you can have a placebo enhanced effect. Um, you know, Pam, maybe you can speak to that. Doctors use placebos of their expectancy all the time. And if you go to a doctor, you expect to get a medicine that'll help you to get better. Well, we're all biased, right? We all have expectancy. You wouldn't be doing this if you didn't have expectancy bias. Um, so people get lost in these word shuffles and then these definitions, and I think they lose the forest for the trees. So our second paper, which we hope also to be published shortly, is uh, showing uh, in increase in uh, effects that are hard to explain using expectancy uh, bias uh, or placebo or whatever other confounder that you wish to use. Pam, do you want to build off of that? Um, yeah, well, they, like like Paul said, like, when you do a prospective observational study, which the microdose.me is, it uh, you have a response bias. People who are interested will join. That's a response bias. But because it's not a controlled clinical trial where you have two arms or three arms, there's no placebo or expectancy part. So it is a response bias. So yeah, of course, if you're not interested in microdosing or you don't even care about microdosing, you're not even gonna enter the study. So there's always a bias that way. Um, and like and like Paul said, us doctors and, and therapists, we all use it placebo. We hope that just you showing up means, <laughs> you know, there's hope to get better that your doctor will actually give you some advice that's really useful for you. And, uh, and and help you get uh, forward on your healing journey. So we have that all the time, just like you have the expectant, expectancy that the meal you just ordered will be delicious. Otherwise you wouldn't have ordered it. So there's this, so it, 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 kind of making it a, a simple analogy, but that's really what expectancy uh, or response bias means. The other thing I want to put a little pitch out for, because I, I love this study so much because it, it, it combines researchers that understand how to do clinical trials with everybody so everybody it's citizen science it truly is and so version two is coming out next year and what we have been doing you know a lot of people have been giving a lot hundreds of people have been giving us feedback what about this what about that these questions were worded wrong you should have said this you should have asked this and we love this this is what science is about science is about doing something publishing it getting feedback making it better it's not about being perfect there's no such thing you're always going to make mistakes. That's a cool thing about being a human. You're always going to make mistakes and then you learn from them, hopefully, and move forward. And same in science. And that's what we did here. And so we've been meeting with people from all sorts that have other things. They're like, what about postmenstrual dysphoria syndrome? You know, we're microdosing and it seems to be working. Will you study that? So I've been sitting down with all sorts of different people, all, you know, from every as anyone that that has ideas of what should be in this trial because there's all sorts of microdosing groups out there that are sharing information and what if we could help them study it what if we could get better answers and to me this really excite this is exciting this is citizens getting involved with research and then from a trial like this or a study like this i mean is then you can see where the signals are and then you can launch a really good quality clinical trial and go is it real did what is what we saw from people doing this real, and then you can do that. So it's- Yeah, and, but, but there's also a professional code of conduct that I would like to bring to the table here. For other uh, fellow researchers, should you have a disagreement with a study or a question about the study, don't go on social media, don't go on Twitter. I mean, <laughs> what does that do? Do you want, you want to be a troll to create flames uh, in, 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 the, in the ecosystem? Of psychedelics, if psychedelics haven't taught you anything, is the spirit of cooperation and respect. And this is, I think, also the important point with indigenous elders that I've met. It's about respect. You need to respect where these medicines came from. These medicines are giving you information to help inform you to be a better earth citizen. You need to respect the origins of this knowledge and how to carry it forward. And what we unfortunately have seen because of just this article came out is um, people pay, they can pot shots and rather writing the authors, which I have done myself before, um, can you please clarify this, this, this comment you made or this, this, I have some questions, et cetera. 
Uh, but we were really chagrined that other scientists in this field would uh, start trolling on Twitter rather than corresponding with the authors. And I'm sure they would like to be given the same the professional you know, code of conduct response in their articles. So, but it just, it just, there's a big opposition to microdosing, folks. There's a lot of, pe lot of people do not believe microdosing works. Um, and we are gathering evidence that is challenging uh, that prejudice or that assumption. Um, and the way of science, as Dr. Pam mentioned, is that you, know, you hone uh, your skills, you get better at your, your designs, uh, you ask critical questions, but why go on t Twitter? <laughs> it's like, it just baffles the mind. It speaks volumes of the individuals who maybe need to indulge in these sacred substances more often because maybe they didn't get the message. I'm, I'm not sure. So I'm just waxing poetic here. Um, well, I won't go in there, although I'd like to talk about grammar a little bit, but uh, that's a little, that's a little. <laughs> Calm uh, <laughs> the, the one I did, I did see a, a thing to scroll by and I see, and actually James Fadiman is being mentioned there too. James okay. is great. James has joined our research team, which is exciting because you know he is long, he is an elder in this area, and we're honored that he's joined the research team. So that's fantastic. Um, but you know this placebo effect. Somebody it scrolled through the comments, and and this was in our meeting um, this morning. Actually, our, our research our microdosing research team meets um, Thursday mornings, and that's exactly what Jim said. It's like it really is just we're just maximizing the natural healing effect. And we're and do you really it's, it's almost disrespectful to call that placebo that we have this we have this innate healing ability and maybe we need to over time change the vernacular around that maybe yeah placebo is a uh, I mean it, there's really great articles uh, in in the science in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, saying that uh, people who are depressed are immunologically depressed people who are happier are immunologically at a better state of being able to resist this disease. This is the way of our being, folks. We all have an embedded bias. You know, we if you were to take out every single individual that had a bias, you wouldn't have anybody in your clinical trials. <laughs> By definition, this makes a human a human. Uh, so now we are seeing, uh, we, have do, we have found something rather phenomenal. And this uh, speaks to something that is going to bring a lot of controversy and, I think people are going to twist themselves into academic pretzels trying to explain this. But um, in their upcoming paper, we did a, psych a psychomotor skill test uh, called the tap test, alternating fingers, how quickly you can tap in 10 seconds. This is a validated test for traumatic brain injury, uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. Uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, people don't get better. Um, uh, and traumatic brain injury, a lot of them people do get better. You know, I, I had a, one of a friend of mine's uh, husband fell off a roof, hit his head, and they did the alternating tap test. And progressively, as inflammation went down, then his tapping went up. But unfortunately, with uh, neurological, with many neuropathies, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, MS, et cetera, uh, there is neurodegeneration. So what we found with microdosing with a stack of, of niacin, lion's mane, and psilocybin, um, which is over 50% of the people who are stacking are using this, this combination, there was a massive increase in the 55 plus year olds uh, in the tap test from approximately 43 taps to 73 taps in 30 days. Now, how can you explain that? Uh, how, what, what placebo, what bias would be selective for 55 year old pluses. When you get older, you know, again, note to self, <laughs> you have neurodegeneration. You're not as agile. How many people fall and uh, elderly people fall, break their hip, get an infection, go to the hospital and die. That's a very, very common story. Uh, so if this psychomotor benefit from microdosing, uh, you know, we did, we looked into the literature and from ideation, to tapping your fingers, there's a lot of parts of your brain that are involved. Uh, so if this suggestive result, which is cannot be explained away by bias or expectancy or placebo, whatever confounder you want to, to attribute to it, 
it's a real effect, folks. It's a real effect. Uh, and this, I think, suggests that of neurogeneration, neuroregeneration, and neurogenesis. Those are all three different things, by the way. So neurogenesis is happening in, in the hippocampus. Um, and we have now found cellular mechanisms of action that actually we can demonstrate in vitro and also with a, a genomic mapping, finding gene expressions that are stimulated with this combination far more so than psilocin uh, by itself. Psilocybin becomes psilocin. So that's what's docking with your 5-HT2A receptors. So we have found something that really is quite, got us all very surprised that there's a psychomotor uh, demonstrated increase in your skills of, of the tap test. This could be a, a door or opening into something that's truly fundamentally uh, changing in medicine is that we can become, we can regrow neurons, we can regrow brain neurons, we can get better psychomotor skills. Of course, this all has to be tested, but this is the type of signal from the noise that exactly what Pam talked to me about years ago uh, was what microdose.me gives us. So we're calling for citizen scientists all over the world. We want to get a million people into microdose.me. You know, when we get such a large data set and the p-value of significance on this tap test is 0 0.004. Um, that's highly, highly significant. It's not marginally significant. It's in the extreme level of, of significance. And look at the variability of the people taking psilocybin mushrooms in various sources. They are taking very, various amounts of them, anywhere from you know a tenth of a gram to, to even a half a gram. Uh, most people are in the one third of a gram. <coughs> and the, the, so in the lion's mane, they're getting from various sources. You have all these confounders that would dilute the effect if there was an effect. And yet we see such strong signal. That just suggests to, to most of us that we have better controls. The signal would even be stronger because the, uh, there'd be less variables that would be confounding and diluting this out. So I think we've, we're entering into something that I think is paradigm shifting. That, um, and I just wanna state this because I really, really believe this. We have entered into a new period of time where we can become a new species. We are not the homo sapiens of 200,000 years ago. In this time, damn well time, that we become a new species, that we evolve into a higher state of consciousness. And I think that psilocybin, you know, fundamentally can do this. I think that we could think about the body intellect of knowledge our culture lead, uh, loses with every elder that gets Alzheimer's. They can't pass on the knowledge. They can't teach. You know, with the, the loss to society is enormous. If we can preserve the intellectual capital and increase intelligence, we increase creativity, and we're more creative, you're happier, you're more happier, your immune system is upregulated, you're more resistant to, to disease. So I, I think this informs, you know, on so many different levels, it is time for us to become a new species. It's time for us to pay attention to the earth. It's time for us to be responsible earth citizens, because if we do not become better earth citizens, we will become extinct. That is the lesson of, of nature and evolution. 99% of all species become extinct. We are at an extinction event that we can control. And if we don't become good earth citizens, we're not gonna be here. I think it's the end of the human race. Hmm. Wow. Responsible earth citizens. Thanks, Paul. Um, hard to segue away from that. Actually, I wanna go back in a little bit, uh, but uh, so you talked about how microdosing works and I, and I just a little bit there and I'm just kind of going off script on the questions, but I sense that a lot of people that are here tonight are, are here because of microdosing, how, because of how popular it's become and specifically even in the last 20 days or so since your study came out and the paper, paper came out, I just end of one here, I've had about 20 people in that 20 days ask me about microdosing without me having to reach out to anyone, just coming to me and asking. I mean, I post a little bit about it. People know I'm involved, I guess, but could you explain a little bit more about how microdosing actually works at the biological level? Like you talked a little bit about how psilocybin turns into psilocyne and then works with the serotonin 2A receptor, but I think that'd be helpful for people in describing that difference that they would feel 
Um, Cause you talked about placebo a bit there. I'd just be curious um, to hear your sort of simplified version of what is actually happening on a microdose. Okay, I'll be glad to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think I'll let Paul answer this, but I think that the, the preface to that is that what is the full mechanism of action of anything? We often just don't know. We often don't know why, why something works. We have theories and we're hungry for knowledge and maybe one day we'll figure it out. We only figured out aspirin not long ago and we've had it for a very long time. So we may not get to that, the main questions around science before I pass it off to Paul to kind of work down through the theories of these is that, is it safe and does it work? And then hopefully we'll get smart enough at some point, we'll become smart enough to have the science to be able to really fully elucidate the mechanism of action. Yeah, a great, great example of that is as aspirin, salicylic acid. Mm -hmm. uh, well known by, by First Nations in North America, you know, and elsewhere and around the world that it was it would uh, suppress pain never knew the mechanism of, of accident until just recently uh, but it was safe you know largely and it, it suppressed pain so the mechanism of action uh, we there's a company called Eurofins they have over 50,000 employees if you can believe it they're extremely well respected and they're a genomics uh, a company and we send them blinded samples um, different concentrations uh, psilocin, we can get one milligram of psilocin legally. Uh, we don't need a license for that. Um, and then we titrate a different amounts of, of psilocin, lion's mane, and nicotinic acid, the flushing form of niacin. And uh, we've, we did what's called MAPK kinases. These are proteins um, that are expressed. When they're expressed, they bind with the receptors to stimulate nerve growth factors. So um, this is very this is very widely used in, uh, in neuro by neuroscientists. And we found it is astonishing um, that when psilocin and nicotinic acid and lion's mane were combined, uh, there was a synergy of action. So uh, psilocin stimulated to some degree, uh, niacin almost had no stimulation, lion's mane had a little bit, all three of them together had a massive synergistic amount. That's higher than the expected additive cumulative effects uh, that you stack on top of each other. And that comes with a big presumption. They're all acting at the, at, at the same, at the same, uh, on the same receptors, et cetera. So we found that now um, in about six different uh, MAPK tests, this is a track C, A, B, and C. Um, track B is in your hippocampus, uh, strong stimulation. Track C is your central nervous system. Uh, this stimulates nerve growth factors uh, to be coded. And so we do have a mechanism of action. Now, the reason why I chose nicotinic acid is the flushing form is a vasodilator. And also I'm a contrarian. Through the 60s and 70s, I recorded probably a dozen lectures I've given. How many people in the audience heard that nicotinic acid, niacin, would bring you down from a, trip on sul a bad trip on sulfibin? And, you know, 10, 20, 30 of the older people usually would raise their hands. Well, I thought oppositely. Actually, it, nicotinic acid does not bring you down. It actually facilitates neurogenesis by being a vasodilator. Um, and then also the nicotinic acid, and uh, by bundling it with low dose of the psilocybin, it becomes an antibuse for like with alcoholics. Because the problem with microdosing is how are you going to sell it? How are you going to get the, out to the public? People can buy 20 microdoses and they can do a macrodose. So the, the, the regulators would not like that. So by stacking it with nicotinic acid, if you haven't taken nicotinic acid, 25 to 50 milligrams, don't feel much. 100 milligrams, most people do. Uh, flushing, itching, redness. Um, believe me, if you take one or two grams of nicotinic acid, this is the last time you'll ever take it. Um, you can't wait till it's over. Um, and so because of vasodilation and then bundling it with nicotinic acid, it allows, I think, microdosing to be a vehicle. That was my hypothesis. Little did I know that nicotinic acid would be a catalyst in vitro uh, with these uh, genetic expressions that code for proteins that result in, in uh, nerve growth factor activation. So we do have the mechanisms of action. And then we also then grew out uh, neurons in vitro uh, in culture. Uh, and we can see the neurons growing 
uh, and forking more synaptogenesis, uh, more neurons, more connections. And this is what I think happens fundamentally when people have a, a big trip on psilocybin um, is that you develop ability of having a new neurological pathway. And then if you, a therapist can capitalize on that or microdosing after a macro dose, then you can go through that same neurological pathway that you've discovered or has been created or is growing and you have an alternative way of thinking, alternative way of being able to, to behave. Um, and I think now this is um, where behavioral science and results is now being tied to cellular data and genomic data that we can see this connection. So I really look forward <laughs> and I'm, I'm open to contrarians. Tell me why this should be, should not work. You know, yeah. the fact is we're seeing this signal. Uh, how can you explain it away? Um, it's not, it, the most logical um, conclusion is that it's building neurons that's affecting your behavior. And we can see this psychologically and we can see this neurophysiologically. Um, yeah, the best part about all this is there's like as much wisdom as you just shared, we still know nothing. And there's so much more to, there's so much more to uncover. And we're, we're just getting started. We're scratching the surface. Not to diminish the wisdom that you have, of course. No, no, if, this, this, is a, this is a community effort, folks. All yeah. of you can participate on it. This is not some ivory league and ivory tower, you know, with scientists and lab coats that, that, you know, are egotistical. I mean, we all have egos, but this is citizen scientists, you know, supporting uh, something that I think can, can really be a game changer. So we need uh, we we need the skeptics. We we need critical thinking. Uh, we need people to report on microdose.me. So I would just we want to get to a million people. Think of that. Think of we had this big data, and then we can look at really unusual uh, uh, diseases that have or common diseases that have no remedies. So this is, this could really change the entire medical. Uh, this could be a medical historical breakthrough uh, of enormous uh, consequences. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to segue a little bit away from where we've gone with the psychedelic side of things into more of the functional side of things. Uh, and Corey, one of our, uh, one of our volunteers, uh, he's a great uh, audio video person and a social and content creator for us. Um, he has a bit of a cheeky question here too, but uh, what is the status of bee mushroom feeder? that you were developing uh, that fed mycelium to bees rather than sugar water. And then uh, he's a second, uh, two part second question around uh, forging tips uh, for anyone on Vancouver Island, what kind of trees or flora to look for as an indication for what mushrooms might be growing. And then uh, a little cheeky part here at the end, uh, he's just asking if he could take you over coffee uh, if you ever come to Victoria. <laughs> a quad mocha, <laughs> lots of whipped cream. Uh, okay, well, I... Um, so first yeah, part was about the bee mushroom feeder, and second part was about fields and tips. Got it. Um, I have this invention of this little bee feeder. It's very cool. Um, what's not cool about it is it uses plastic. Um, so we want to use ocean recycled plastic. Um, so I just don't feel good about putting out, uh, we have post-consumer recycled plastic as an option. You'd be, uh, most of you probably know now the supply chain issues due to COVID have been extraordinarily disruptive. You can't even get for a long time, little glass bottles or the spritzers because so many people had hand lotion, you know, the hand lotion market exploded. So all this being said is that we do have a source for ocean recycled plastic. Uh, that should be online in about a year. So I want to be, I want to walk my talk. You know, I'm trying to do that as best as I can. I just don't feel good about using virgin, what's called virgin plastic, unless we can get, you know, we can use hemp plastic and injection molding. We'll open source the code for people who are 3D printers. So that's still on development, but we have an alternative. Um, that's a modification of a bird feeder that, and so we're releasing the extracts 
for wild bees on around May 1st. Um, now, other article that we published in Nature, and this is important, this is a good segue, I think, because it brings the two things together. This art, other article I published in Nature on the primary author, eight other authors, and reducing viruses in, in honeybees. It's in the 99th point ninth percentile in Nature, because we reduce viruses in bees more than 45,000 times with one treatment. There's no pharmaceutical that's ever done that for bees. Um, and now we have evidence that increases their lifespan. So a natural product can be more powerful than a pharmaceutical. Hmm. Psilocybin mushrooms may be more powerful than psilocybin. Hmm. This is where I think that we now have this opportunity of natural products with their standardized, that the synergistic effect of the analogs and the complexity of the compounds is a perfect application of natural products of, for helping immunity and over and general immunity. I mean, bees are animals, folks. And maybe those of you know my research with BioShield, the biodefense program, my TED talk talks about this. Um, and the very same mushrooms that do reduce viruses in bees, reduce viruses in swine, pigs, birds, fowl, ducks. Um, so we are intimately in this matrix with mycelium uh, that influences our immunological and neurological health. And this is what, so because honeybees are considered minor livestock, and because we reduce viruses in livestock, the FDA will say that these extracts are a drug. We're working with the FDA for the past two and a plus years to get this allowed. And actually they've become very friendly to this idea. It's not like we're many of these regulators, you butt your heads, you get to know them after a while, and then they're really trying to help you. Um, but they have their certain guardrails and they have to conform to. Honey, honeybees are livestock, but wild bees are not. So there's no regulatory uh, regulations that we violate. So we're launching, to answer your question and give you some context here, we're launching the extracts for wild bees around May 1st. We have a glass modified bird feeder with marbles in it that we're going to have as an interim bee feeder just so citizen scientists can start helping the bees. So this, this may be the solution to the colony collapse disorder uh, and helps biosecurity, help the food webs, prevent poverty, protect you know, so many people on so many different levels. And zoonotic diseases are coming from immunocompromised animals, you know, at the margins of collision of industrialization and human activity with the wild ecosystem. So this, this is very exciting to us. And again, I think it's uh, the natural products have come into the forefront as being medically extremely useful when we are facing these complex challenges. It's not gonna be a single molecule solution. Thanks. Um, I wanna keep going on that, picking up where you left off with the, the plastic piece at the beginning there. Uh, Kyle, uh, another member of ours, he asked, uh, he's been curious about how mushrooms can break down plastic oil and other uh, things in the environment to remediate the environment. What scalable methods exist to implement this personally or as a community? That's the key, the key words there, what's scalable method. Mm -hmm. uh, we have numerous fungi now that, have, that can break down plastics, you know, never underestimate fungi. <laughs> they'll, they'll break down anything, it seems, ultimately. Um, and they'll dissociate the, the, the molecules, let me put it that way. Um, so um, scalability and application is, is a huge hurdle. Uh, we have great demonstrations of breaking down oil and diesel with oyster mushrooms. We can do this. We can demonstrate it. We can repeat it. The scalability fashion is, is it, it challenge is, is really a hurdle that's been difficult to overcome. I would encourage, <laughs> I'm hoping that microdosing with psilocybin will stimulate the creativity and young people's brains to come up with a paradigm shifting solution of making these things scalable. Okay. So... <laughs> that, that'd be great. So but you, you have, you have, your, your, your 
team have has demonstrated success with oyster mushrooms on on booms, right? Stuff yeah, with- but, but yeah, mycelium running has we've published this. This is it's been re re. You know, many other people have done this. We're involved in astromycology right now and using oyster mushrooms to break down hydrocarbons on asteroids to create soils uh, for the interplanetary colonization of space. Uh, we received a, a NASA grant uh, through an associate, you know, and we have another NASA grant that's going in. So this whole idea of terraforming other planets, uh, may, if you don't know, there's a lots of hydrocarbons in space. Uh, fungi can break them down, dissociate them, create fungal sugars, fungal sugars then get exploited by bacteria. You can create soil, and the soil then grows plants. So we can terraform other planets using fungi. Um, you know, that is kind of a focused use of microremediation uh, for creating a livable habitats. Um, when you have a giant oil spill, um, it's, it's, a, it's just mechanistically much more difficult uh, to deploy these solutions. We can do them in the laboratory, but to do them in nature on this planet has some really just problem, de- delivery system problems. So, you know. There's lots, of lo- there's lots of smart people watching, so. Yeah, there's no shortage, there's no shortage of this subject. I, I, I'm, you know, I wish I could be a graduate student a thousand times over because I'd have no shortage of subject to be able to explore. I, uh, I'm just being mindful of time with about seven minutes left. I wanted to ask two final questions for Pam. Uh, unfortunately, I apologize to everyone who, who, who did attend. We've got 47 questions here that I haven't touched. Uh, so we'll have, to, we'll have to try to do this again, maybe 14 times more, because it seems like there's a lot of interest here. But uh, Stephen asks um, from our membership, what steps would you recommend a psychedelic novice take to be involved in a psychedelic assisted psychotherapy session despite not being terminally ill or currently undergoing treatment for depression? I want to be respect, I want to respectfully partake in the preparation session integration process for personal growth and enlightenment, but do not uh, know where to look or who to ask for help. Yeah, that's a, that's a challenging question. And the, the challenge with that for me as a medical doctor, um, others could be able to answer differently, but because I am a regulated professional, is that these substances are really not yet legal. Uh, ketamine is. Uh, my program does ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, um, and it is, it is done as a psychedelic uh, medicine. Um, but, you know, LSD and MDMA and, and psilocybin are not yet legal um, in Canada, where, where I am. Um, or in the U.S., although, you know, we're looking, there's legalization or decriminalization in, in many states, in many counties, in many cities across Canada and in the U.S. There are countries that have legal um, options, Costa Rica, Mexico, Jamaica, uh, the Netherlands. But, you know, fundamentally, this goes back to the, an earlier activism question. You know, it basically is saying that you have to have the means to do that. And I think that's unfair. I don't think access should be dependent on your ability to pay for access to these medicines. So again, it goes back to, we need to let our MPs and MLAs know that we want them to bring, to have this allowance, whether for personal use or how we're doing it with the, the, the made uh, Mora campaign, a Canada sports campaign, having psilocybin available if you are at end of life. Um, but you, you know, I, it, your question's fantastic and it's a difficult answer. There's a lot going on in the underground. I'm sure there's a, there's a lot of great networks and, and we would, I hope that we can talk more openly about it or at least myself as a, as a regulated professional can, can speak more clearly on that, even though I know all these resources exist and the CPA is trying to help with that a lot. Yeah, I was gonna say we have a private networking platform that there's a lot of conversation around this happening within the community. So I would suggest for anyone that's interested in that similar topic, um, join cpa.ca if I haven't said that already. Uh, I think we'll try to get through one more question here. I, it's one of my favorites from the 47 that came through. Emmeline asks, there seems to be a focus on psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, but realistically not everyone can afford the high cost. How would you envision the possibility of psychedelic assisted peer support as well as peer support provided after the experience? Pam, this might be for you. As I'm sure you've yeah, it's, a, it's a nice thought. The program, I, I'm uh, uh, my team, it, it's all group. And I love the group setting. I think it, it really, um, it's, you know, we're all longing for community and love and connection. 
And so if you can, if it is a, a system of setting up peer support where you can come together ahead of time and get to know each other a little bit, you know, and, and get to know some of your, you know, your hopes, your intentions, your strengths, um, the agreements of how this the ceremony will go. I think that's really nice. And then and then commit to connecting after and and integrating together and following up. But you have to hold a very tight container. You have to hold a good set and setting. And then you should have a contingency plan, um, you know, that access to people that can nav help navigate. Because some people do have very challenging experiences. Some people have very beautiful experiences with no challenges. But if you are having, you know, these, these medicines can really shake up your reality um, in a good way, I think. You know, the pieces can shatter and then they have to settle and then you have to integrate that. And when you have a really good, that, uh, you know, that's usually the job of a really good therapist or a really good peer supporter. Um, so I think there is a model there. And so perhaps what we can do is, is model what is a really good peer support uh, container look like and how can we have this more accessible in, 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 and get the cost out of it. But again, I, I, I fully advocate as a physician that this should be covered in the healthcare system. The cost savings are immeasurable. You know, every time you get a parent healthier or a healthcare worker back to work or somebody out of their depression or somebody out of their trauma, that's a massive savings um, to their family and their friends just to have that person back, never mind the savings, uh, financial savings. So keep advocating. Um, and if you are going to do it on your own, really go into it thoughtfully. There's a lot of great resources, a lot of great resources on the website at the CPA. And be intentional. It's important. It's important to really be intentional with this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Pam. And we're just at about time here. I just want to give one last uh promotion for the giveaway that we do have running uh, as a segue from where Pam left off. Inside uh, the membership, you have an access to a private networking platform with tons and tons of educational re resources that are constantly being updated, connections to free events like this, um, and many more other great perks. And with the giveaway, uh, we have uh, $4,000 in prizes for anyone that joins before December 20th, including, uh, like I mentioned before, a scholarship, a plant medicine scholarship to Hollow Global Retreats. Uh, also, for any of you in Vancouver who know the Sentinel Retreat Center uh, in, in Caslow, um, the, they're offering up a two-night stay with them, uh, and it's a beautiful, wonderful piece of land, um, along with uh, one of five copies of Paul's book and uh, also uh, some tickets to the Catalyst in-person psychedelic conference next year, which we're super excited to be a, a, a sponsor in. Um, and I think I'll leave it there. Any last words, Pam and Paul, before we end things? I do want to say thank you both for for joining us. I know your time is super, super valuable and I know the community uh, really appreciates it as do I. And thank you all to everyone who showed up to uh, really appreciate all your attention tonight. I'll just say I'll, before, I'll let Paul finish because he's so poetic, but the CPA is working really hard for everyone. And if you can support us in any way, shape or form, that is fantastic. Join, get a membership. If you can help with the Canada Supports campaign, please help, it's very important. Um, we have, you know, most probably thousands and thousands of hours at the CPA leaning in because this is important work. Well, I, I want to thank everybody in this community. It does take a community, you know, to, and this knowledge has been passed on by Indigenous people. It, it's so important to recognize their struggle. Um, this is such powerful medicine that it is disruptive to the orthodox authoritarian uh, you know, viewpoint. And, but this is really an uprising of the people across the planet. Mushrooms have become the zeitgeist of our time. This is something that I think inspires people. And it's a little bit edgy, it's out there. It's the forbidden fruit, it's in the underground. You know, it has all these wonderful metaphors. Um, but this is a really a call to action for citizen scientists to step up. Uh, I just very much plead with people that every breath that you take, every step that you take on this planet is precious and has an impact. And we have a responsibility to perform to a higher standard. And we have not met that higher standard, most of us. 
but it's just time for us as a community to hold hands and to, together we can do something that I think is truly significant and we need you. So I will, I will contribute $5,000 to the Canadian Psychedelic Association. I'm hoping other people listening uh, will also support because you are the vanguard, the leading edge um, and being able to carry this message forward within the legal constructs that we must perform within. We cannot do this quote unquote illegally without inviting authoritarian response. We can do this internally just to change the laws. And I think that we have this amazing opportunity to do that. And my experience with government officials is that folks are not all bad. They're people too. They wanna to do the right thing. Uh, but you have to be able to protect them in their courageous decisions uh, so they don't lose their career. They don't lose their income. Uh, they're not ostracized. We need to protect these people who are also involved in changing the system from within. But let's give them the, the good reasons that they can bring forward. Uh, and by doing so, the commons will be will will benefit. So, but I appreciate I appreciate everybody. Thank you, Dr. Pam, so much for inviting me into this community. Um, if it wasn't for you, you know, I wouldn't be here in so many ways. So I have deep respect for your courage uh, as a medical doctor you know, taking the lead because we need more voices like you. So. Absolutely. Couldn't have said any better. Thank you for your generosity, Paul and, and Pam too, for, I know you guys are up at the early hours of the night, at early hours of the morning and staying up late at night, working on all of this. So really, really just from the bottom of my heart, thank you guys so much. And uh, I know there's a few people trickling in and we went over time, but Pam, I know you wanted to share a photo. Yeah. A story behind all of this, but well, thank you for, for all I just, We'll just share one photo as we end this. I, I will share the one photo as we end this. This is uh, Paul, much younger. He's been doing this a long time. This is Paul uh, holding up uh, a copy of his book, The Mushroom Cultivator, as you can see oyster mushrooms growing out of his book. So a great photo. Well, from decomposition, there's regeneration. <laughs> We're all gonna decompose, but we create the soils for the next generation. Let's, let's, let's do a great decomposition. So, Well said, and I don't think there's anything more to add from there. Thank you so much, you guys. Really appreciate uh, all your time. Everyone who, who made it and stuck around a little, little bit extra got this, this nice little present. Uh, speaking of presents, happy holidays, everybody. Uh, thanks for showing up tonight. Really appreciate it. All the best for the rest of the week.